meeting is being recorded. And I'm the head of AI at the Electric Consultant. We help uh, companies move to the AI era. Uh, my expertise is uh, neural networks and computer vision, but uh, it's been expanded to the years. Anyway, today we're going to talk about uh, this recent, uh, the recent breakthroughs that have been happening in computer vision that may, may have left a lot of people behind. Uh, it's been like an onslaught of continuous innovation through these years. So it's, I understand that it's very hard for people not in the field to keep up. So uh, I'll do a small introduction and then we'll move to the, to the fancy new stuff, all right? So some, uh, some intro, <clears throat> all right. So what is, uh, today we're gonna talk, uh, we're gonna take a historic dive, we're gonna go through the 70s up until uh, 2024. I'm gonna see like some amazing innovations that have happened during the last few years. So uh, it's been a uh, it's been a very exciting journey, like uh, seeing this stuff evolve. Uh, Commuter Vision has been the main beneficiary, along with NLP, of the AI revolution. Uh, Commuter Vision, for those who don't know, is the field of AI that helps uh, machines interpret and understand visual information. That may include image recognition, object detection, scene understanding, a human pose estimation, a depth, a molecular depth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so from the dawn of computer vision in the 1970s, 60s, 70s, people who have been working with uh, mostly edge detection and trying to handcraft features. When I say feature, is like patches of pixels that have specific patterns. Uh, from that on, it, they understood that it was way, way more difficult than they expected. Okay, so a major breakthrough happened in the 1998 when Jan LeCun, he, he earned the, uh, the Turing Award recently. Uh, he designed the first convolutional neural network trying to figure out how to uh, automate postal service uh, readers. So he made the first convolutional neural network, it was called the LENET. It had uh, two, convolutional neural, uh, two convolutional layers, two pulling, uh, three dense layers. I will explain what they are. Right, so this is how it looks. Uh, convolution, subsampling with the pulling, convolution, subsampling, and then put, put connections. Uh, I'll explain what these things are now, right? What is convolutions, for those who don't know, that's a mathematical operation applied to input data. Usually is a convolutional filter, we call it kernel, along with a bias. Uh, it involves sliding the filter along the input data and computing the dot product. Uh, what it does, uh, this is a mathematical formula right here, right? And this is how it looks on, uh, on, the, on the machine. Uh, what it does is quite simple. It's just, pic it's just pixel wise uh, or matrix wise uh, uh, multiplication and addition. And these things, through training, through what we call the training and the data set, they learn to adjust their weights. Their weights are the, are the, the filters. And uh, they, they maximize that value at, at the relevant features. So through training, they give more accurate prediction of what it is they are trying to do. Uh, right. So what does it learn? It, it was, if you stack a lot of the a lot of these things, they try they through time and they, a lot of sub data they learn like a higher abstractions of increased complexity uh, of of pixels. So this what you see here low level features and these things below these are not the kernels per se. This is the maximum activation of those kernels, and this is if you stack more on top of those and convolute again, they learn even more higher abstractions and then even more higher abstractions. And for example, it could be faces, it could be parts of cars, it could be parts of car, it could be parts of the car, etc., etc. So Jan LeCun and uh, the other innovators of that time, they, they were in the middle of a, what is called now an AI winter. That is a period of time that had a lot of uh, very little uh, enthusiasm about neural networks. At that point, people were more interested in uh, cascades, 
in uh, boosted trees, in SBMs, and all that stuff. And uh, neural networks were, were quite expensive, and they have had quite a bad rap, and because of some failures at the uh, some overfitting events, let's say that. And uh, what happened? They got some bad rap. They could not compute some specific function, the famous XOR problem at that point. So before it was fixed, uh, they had this like what's called AI winter, meaning that there was very low, little enthusiasm, hence very little funding. So what happened is at two, on 2012, uh, in the I think it's uh, the Hinton's lab. He got the, he shared the, uh, the Turing Award with Jan LeCun uh, and Bengio, the three people, right? Uh, they designed the first, it was called Deep Neural Network. It's a deep convolutional neural network. It was called AlexNet due to the inventor, the first in the, in the paper. And it achieved a very uh, a steep uh, increase in accuracy in the, in, in the image net competition. And it is sparked like a, a, a renewed interest in that. You can see it's uh, one, two, three, four, five convolutions, making it actually deep instead of shallow, which is like two, two convolutions, and then followed by three dense uh, matrices. Uh, this is how it looks on paper or on, or on a graph. You start with the uh, patches of red, green, blue, convolute and shrink, convolute and shrink, convolute and shrink, and then you do a full layer, and then you do softmax, for those who don't know, uh, that's the activation. Softmax converts uh, logits to probabilities. Uh, this was a huge breakthrough, a huge breakthrough, meaning if you can see the graph here, the top five accuracy was at 25%, uh, uh, the error was at 25, and then it failed at uh, 10. It was a huge innovation. It was a phase transition from old traditional methods. And then everybody, many quite reluctantly because uh, there was no good foundations for deep learning, theoretical ones at that point, they moved, everybody moved to deep learning. There was nothing else. Everybody abandoned whatever they were doing and they moved to deep learning. So from 2012 and onwards, it's been all deep learning and nothing else. And this curve, as a rich and asymptotic now, meaning ImageNet is mostly solved. Now we want even more hard, harder problems. Uh, the persistence and innovation of, it wasn't only uh, Hinton, it was the persistent innovation of researchers from several universities, engineers making GPUs uh, compatible and fast, tinkerers like finding small tricks that work, that stage that people are moving in 2012. And then that showed everybody that deep convolutional neural networks was the future. And this is how we, we solved this thing. ImageNet was a 1.2 million images train, 100,000 K test. And we had 1,000 object classification. And we hit 10.5 top five accuracy, top 10.5% accuracy uh, on, top, on top five. This thing sparked a huge innovation in the field. You wouldn't imagine at that point, before 2012, it was like neural networks what? And then it was insane. Okay, so what did uh, Alex and uh, Hinton did in that paper? They trained with the whole image net. It was insane. Most methods cannot handle so much data. Most, uh, most uh, algorithms cannot handle so much data. Uh, so this was quite new. The deep architecture, eight layers, five convolutions, for that period of time was insane. It was convol many convolutions uh, stacked. At that point, two was the max. They went to five. Uh, the ReLU activations rectified linear units. These are kind of an innovative activation. It, it solved a, a few problems. Their documentation, they documentation, they were not happy with the 1.2 million training images. They even wanted more, so they applied active documentation during training. And they used dropout regularization to deactivate neurons during training to avoid overfitting. When they gave their interviews, they, they won the competition, they gave their interviews, they said that the, the win was held to ReLU and dropout. This is 
this is where they gave the, the most emphasis. But in essence, all of this made sense after, after that. So 62 million parameters was insane at that moment. Now we're talking, we're there of billions. But at that moment, it was insane. Max pooling, again, spatial, <clears throat> spatial subsampling. It was something that was not common at that point. They pushed this thing, this trend. Uh, Relative activation this is how it looks, nothing fancy, but it has some nice properties. And dropout for uh, disabling neurons and avoiding overfitting. This was one of the main uh, regular, regularization methods that they used. So what this thing did at that moment, 2000 to 2018, I should, it's not 19, it's 2018, what everybody wanted to make their own convolutional neural network. It was insane. It was a mad rush. Uh, Google, NVIDIA, Meta, Facebook, Twitter, everybody. Everybody was, every university was, was in this thing, uh, Microsoft. So we got in very nice innovations from this period. Uh, everybody was struggling to hit like top one accuracy on ImageNet. Uh, and trying along the way to create what is called the holy grail in, uh, in CNNs. CNNs, it should, you should find an architecture that uh, scales well with the number of parameters, meaning that it performs better as we increase the number of parameters. You can see here uh, three, four different uh, uh, families of, uh, of networks. They are essentially, they're quite the same meaning they are all residual, they have uh, multiple kernels at each point, they do some fancy stuff, some uh, attention mechanisms in each one, some have better scaling behavior, but in essence, they, are, they all exhibit this asymptotic behavior where you increase, increase, increase the number of parameters, hence making it more expensive to run, and you hit an asymptotic line like 85% of one accuracy. So at this period, we had the Vingin G. I think it was from, uh, uh, from Oxford, from the Zisserman lab. The ResNet from Microsoft. This was quite an innovation with the residual. Uh, this is used uh, heavily even today. We have the unit architecture, for, for mostly for medical, but it uh, had other uses as well. The inception algorithm for, uh, architecture from uh, Google. Uh, stacking multiple scales at the same time plus projection. This worked very well, quite expensive. Uh, finally, efficient net, which has some attention mechanism on the ch channel wise. And efficient net also had some what is called modest scaling, which became very important later on. So this is how you increase the, this is how you increase different parameter, hyper parameters of the model based on the image size. Uh, so bigger, uh, more channels or bigger windows or bigger, um, more, more deep, et cetera, et cetera. This, uh, we also got a revolution on the activations. We saw everybody was trying to make their own unique activations. These are the most common used ones. The Swish is the most recent one. But there are many, many, many more. Mish is the nice variant of that, of Swish. Anyway, they all look pretty much the same. They have familiar or similar properties. They only look different when you stack like a very large number of uh, convolutional kernels and on them. We also got a, a number of different normalizations. Uh, most in the profession will be familiar with batch normalization and uh, most familiar with the NLP community will be familiar with the N layer normalization, but there are many, many more, many more like group normalization, instant normalization. What these things do, they help the gradients uh, move along the network and they help converge and build deeper models. So with this, you could build a ResNet of 150 layer thick. Otherwise, you would not be able to do that. It would be insane. Uh, what we do, what do you use this uh, 
you first pre-train on ImageNet, and then you have what is called downstream computer vision tasks that refer to specific applications or problems solved a pre-trained model. A pre-train is one model that is trained on ImageNet. It was the bigger resource we had, so you train on that. And then you had a specific problem that you wanted to solve, but you had a very, very tiny amount of data, so you fine-tuned with, fine with that. So what, did that, what does that do? It, it enables the adaptation of existing models to new tasks, reducing the need for excessive data and computational resources. You, you just need a little bit of data to adapt to your new task. So we had object detection, image segmentation, facial recognition, scene understanding, like in, a, in an overall way. Let's see that object detection. Object detection started with, uh, I think it was the Coco uh, data set from Microsoft. And then you had uh, heads that attached to pre-trained data, uh, pre-trained models, but the fast, fast RCNN, faster RCNN, YOLO and SSD, from all these uh, from all these uh, from all these models, the most commonly used now is YOLO version eight, which is dominating the object detection due to its speed and uh, and accuracy. So, in the object detection, it involves identifying and locating objects within an image or video. It's quite it's we are reaching some peak of this, meaning you cannot get better results. Uh, Next one is image segmentation, another downstream task. Uh, image segmentation is mostly used for uh, scene understanding and uh, medical imaging. Medical imaging uses the UNET mostly, but uh, there are others as well. If you've seen some uh, drone with footage or uh, autonomous driving and, also, and all that. Facial recognition is a common task, not only for unlocking your iPhones, that uses RGBMD, uh, but mostly for surveillance, uh, mostly solved by 2014. Uh, SLAM, which is gonna be incorporated into iPhones and Samsungs now. So simultaneous localization and mapping is that it, it tries to give you, a, tries to build a model inside the machine that, uh, that has the sensors to map an area while at the same time with determining where the sensor is. I said the robot here because usually it's an autonomous uh, robot or autonomous car that is doing the slam, but it could be a drone, it could be a phone, it could be anything. And depth estimation, another downstream task, it's trying to estimate the depth of an image from a single image. It's called mono monofocal depth estimation. Uh, it's a, it's a very hard problem, but it, it's mostly solved, meaning we get very nice results from a single image. It does the inference like a human brain at this moment. And human pose estimation is you can see it on filters, uh, you can change your position or your for tracking and all that. And uh, the all encompassing task is called scene understanding. It has, uh, has many, many tasks at, around it. And then when we hit like a peak 2018, uh, at 2017, there was already a new technology trying to take over. So <clears throat> at 2017, we had a new, we had a disrupting paper. Attention is all you need. It came out 2017. It did not have a, it, uh, it got an award in MIPS. It changed NLP forever. Uh, up until that time, people in NLP were using uh, NLP natural language processing. They were using uh, LSTMs or RNNs, uh, the current neural networks. And uh, transformer architecture al came along with this novel attention mechanism. It changed anything. Now, hardly anyone uses uh, the current neural networks. There are some niche cases, but mostly uh, everybody uses it. Uh, transformers. This is the technology that enabled the big, uh, the big models that you can use today, like BERT, ChatGPT, Gemini, and all that. It didn't take. It was not an overnight success. It required some time, and some, uh, you know, every new technology has this phase where early adopters take all the benefits, and people are trying to catch up. So. 
we had uh, 2017, the paper came out. Then we had uh, BERT and GPT that outperformed the LSTMs and RNNs. And then it was all transformers, like nothing else. They revolutionized the NLP space. The, the reason they could do that is that uh, they could scale immensely, meaning they could, uh, you, you could fit them like a trillion data points and they would still fit them. Uh, or, you, or you could stack them as high as you could possibly go and then they will still work. This is a, a technology that scales very, very nicely, but it's very computational heavy and it requires, and because it is computational heavy, it can run mostly on specialized equipment like GP, GPUs. Uh, models like GPT-2, GPT-3 have several million, billions of parameters. We are in CNNs, we're talking about a few million at most. And their training data set is a few trillion tokens. These models have literally trained with a good portion of all human textual information, knowledge. And this is what sparked th this uh, AI innovation. It didn't start now, it didn't start on 22 or 23. It started in 2019. We just needed the uh, best applications to come up. All right, so what is the transformer? Why is it special? The transformer, it has two parts, an encoder and a decoder. The encoder transforms the input sequences into machine-readable representation by capturing not word similarities, token similarities and position. For those not in NLP space, token is like a part of a word, maybe two or three letters. The highest resolution you can go is letter by letter, usually it's two or three letters together. It utilizes input embeddings and positional encoding to prepare the sequence for processing. You stack this, you stack this as high as you can go, analyze the relationship between tokens through multi-head attention blocks, and you get, the, you get the encoding. What it looks like, and then you feed it to the decoder. The decoder utilizes the, the knowledge from the encoder in the prediction cycles, it starts with a start of certain token, and then it predicts the next token and the next token based on the previous, and then on the previous, and then the previous, and then you, this is how you form uh, words, sentences, and it can really go on forever. Uh, initially, it relies on prediction knowledge alone, then combines it with encoder output for further analysis. The output is the probability of the next word in the sequence, and then we do what is called sampling, meaning based on those probabilities, we randomly select and we usually get the highest probability token and, and give it out. And then we do the same again, feed it back and do the same thing again. Uh, this is how it looks in, if you delve into it. The scale dot product attention is uh, like nothing much than a matrix multiplication and as followed by a, by a softmax and then a, ma a multiple matrix multiplication, but you do this many, many times, and then you stack them together. It uh, it's, has a nice gradient profile. It flows very nicely, but it has a few billion parameters. And then it requires immense amounts of data. The transformer uses scaled dot product attention. The attention mechanism forces the model to focus on specific tokens, the relationship between them. This is I don't want the whole image, the whole sentence to be relevant. So unlike global attention, we consider its words importance relative to the entire sequence. Self-attention examines the relationship between tokens. Uh, I'm gonna skip this. Right, this is how it looks. No, but we don't care about transformers. We are in vision, right? But this is what happens next. The transformer, the transformers moved into the vision field. Uh, what happened is <clears throat> we got the vision transformers. It was only a matter of time between somebody figured out how to use transformers in the context of computer vision domain. This paper came out 2020, 2021, and it, uh, and it changed everything for the vision community again. Uh, an image is worth 16 by 16 words. What, what does that mean? It means 
in essence, it takes uh, an image, it uh, breaks it into patches of 16 by 16 pixels, and then it feeds them, it adds some encoding, it flattens them, projects them, and then it's at their position encoding, and uh, feeds them into a transformer. It literally doesn't do much more than that. So from a, from a theoretical point, we created another language based on image patches. Hmm. So visual transformers treat images as sequences of patches, employing the transformer encoding like we did in, like they did in NLP. Despite its simplicity, this approach paired with pre-training, again the pre-training, we need huge amounts of data to make this thing work. Uh, assuming more than four million data points. So it but it provides it provided the remarkably effective. It uh, it hit state of the art very fast on everything, assuming you had pre-training. The self-attention mechanism enabled in, in information integration across the entire image, even in the lowest layers, before we start stacking high, representing a significant advantage over convolutional neural networks, where you had, because of the receptive field, uh, you had the... Uh, <clears throat> In convolutional neural networks, you're stacking information from low to high. So at the very early stages, you start with edges, and then you build higher and higher. However, in uh, transformers, the early representations are much more complex and much cleaner than the convolutional ones. <clears throat> Next. OK, so the, the vision transformers were insanely big. We're talking hundreds of millions of parameters. Uh, this is how many encoders stacks you. And this is how many uh, uh, attention, self-attention layers you stack. And this is the MLP size. This is how many parameters you, have, you add. If you know anything about deep learning, these numbers are huge, like huge. You cannot run them in a commercial, uh, in a, your home machine. <clears throat> Again, there was this insane rush. Everybody had to create a, a, <clears throat> a vision transformer. And usually, you, and you can see it here, the, the balloon size, then the circle size, it's in the, it's, it's how many parameters it has. The x-axis is gigaflops, meaning how much computational operation needs in the billions, and then, and then uh, the top one accuracy, this, this is what we, they were fighting for. And we reached the top here, still dominated by, uh, uh, by convolutional neural networks, but still uh, with a lot of, lots of effort and lots of tricks. The transformers sparked a new generation of models, borrowing previous innovation, like multi-scale models, small number of convolutions, and then the flattening and the projection, different type of activations, normalizations, loss functions, pre-training tasks, uh, relevant tasks, and types of attention. So you can see here the mad rush again. Everybody rushes to do uh, the hot shiny thing. Again, they were pretty good to be honest. <clears throat> uh, and the recent innovation is the multi-scale vision transformer. They took this from UNET where you have stacked, uh, you go deeper and deeper, scaling up the patches. Uh, what it did this transformer, the vision transformer, it, the, the pivotal achieved is that it integrated the images as a kind of a language. So you have this stream of patches and they are really a new modality. Modality like text, modality like speech, structured data, 3D signals, and you could use the same architecture for all. For everyone, for anyone in the AI space, we used you we used to have specialized models for each modality. I mean, I was uh, I had a specialty in vision, so I knew convolutional neural networks. Other people had a specialty in NLP, and they had a, and they had this expertise in RNNs and LSTMs. Now this is lost. Everybody uses transformers. Transformers give the best results across modalities. And now images are just another modality. And you pre-train with everything, everything, text, image, speech, 
everything, 3D signals, medical information, everything, and then you adapt to the task. Okay, the CNNs didn't give up, right? We, we pushed harder and further, and we got the convex family of, uh, of models. This is especially good. Convex V1 and V2, they are extremely good. They have like a ton of tricks inside to make them slightly better than the, be than the best transformer. They did, the Chinese group that did this, had a, <clears throat> they brute forced all the hyperparameters and all the possible configuration of the of the ResNet, and they changed it. They did all these things here, and they mapped everything down, and they brute forced the whole process. And at the end, they got a eighty-two percent <laughs> accurate top one accuracy versus eighty-one point three on the swing uh, transformer. Still, it was better than that, better than the best transformer. So uh, it meant something. It meant that uh, CNNs are not, uh, you know, are not for the for the garbage kind of history, but they could be synergistically used with transformers. The Convex version one and version two came out 2022, 2023. I have personally used Convex, the first version. It is quite good. It's a very tidy architecture. It ju you just need to have all these micro and micro design changes on them. Uh, but you can fine tune them from a high torch or TensorFlow. <clears throat> all right. The next part we got is that uh, the CNNs try to get attention, some kind of attention mechanisms, uh, because uh, uh, transformers were, were having all this exciting transforming. Right. So we got our own squeeze and excite uh, mechanisms for channel attention, added atten attention for across uh, depth attention, self attention similar to what uh, to what transformer, transformers have, CBAM, which is a channel and spatial attention together, and many, 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 many more attention. So there was a huge push to incorporate technologies from transformers uh, and there was some cross-pollination between transformers and CNNs. So we are now 2023, 2024, and we are seeing a huge shift on what is possible and how we work. Now we have, we used to have the pre-training, fine-tuning and prediction pipeline, which was, you started with a, with a generic architecture, you you pre-train on a huge image set, you fine tune on a specific data set, and you make predictions on based on that specific task for that specific image, uh, for that specific task. That was the, the pipeline for all a deep learning AI for at least 10 years. And this was the paradigm that most of us were training. But this changed and changed last year. What we got is the vision language models, which represent a new paradigm with pre-training. Yes, you pre-train on even more data, like huge amounts of data, cross modalities, text, language, pairs of uh, pairs of text and, uh, and images. And you got what is called a zero shot prediction. And uh, based on that, you probably seen, have seen some of, some of that. Uh, you say to the system what you want, or you describe it what you want, and it gives you back a prediction. It really opens up uh, AI to the common man, because there is no need for specialized uh, software skills. You can interact. Uh, you can interact with these things. Let me show you. I don't want to see this thing. Uh, you can interact with it by just pointing at what you want or just describing it in words or making a bounding box. This makes, uh, this makes it like a open for everyone. Now you have this model came out early 2023 by Meta slash Facebook. It's the segment anything. Uh, some of you may have missed it. It was quite, it made quite a splash. Uh, you take an image, you pass it through an encoder, then you 
you give it a box, a bounding box, a point or some text, and you give you and it gives you back uh, the mask of the object that you are looking for. It truly, it truly, it was a, a revelation. It, it destroyed the paradigm, the previous paradigm, forever, or it transformed it. To be honest, right? So I have a video here for the segment anything, and it's uh, you can see it running in real time. Mm -hmm. You sh just show it what you want, and just point, and it and it shows you the class and the segmentation of the image, and it required and it didn't require any specialized knowledge to use. All right, so so what's next after that? Uh, segment anything now uh, came out uh, early 2023. And then again, a huge revolution started on that field. Everybody wanted a, a segment anything in 3D, in medical, uh, you know, in all kinds of applications, really. But what really made an exception was the medical, because uh, uh, medical technicians are quite expensive, and creating medical data sets was uh, is expensive to create, and you have little data and cross modalities. So if you could merge all these modalities together and create a big model to do the work of a medical technician, then you will get some really nice breakthroughs. And then we have now Nature presented the, the segment anything now, medical, some, right? <clears throat> and the current state of the art is the it's called YOLO World. It's based on the YOLO V8, which is the best object detector right now. And what you do with this is uh, you don't have a fixed number of uh, <clears throat> a fixed number of classes. What you what you do is you describe what you want, and it uh, it it on the fly changes the the encoder masks the encoder and creates a new detector based on that. And you can try this. Uh, for example, if you open here this specific <clears throat> site, you can add anything you want. And it gives you uh, the number of classes or whatever you want to do here. And, uh, and it gives you a nice, uh, a nice bounding box across everything. And it can do the same with segmentation. Uh, this is a special, and it's still very, very, very fast compared to anything else. So this is the current state of the state of the art in visual language models. It, if, you are, if you have trained any number of fixed object detector, you, I think you will be amazed to see this technology. So where we are now, it's been a long and arduous journey. There have been ups and downs in the technology, in the hype, in the innovation, and in the investing. Uh, but we are reached a point where the innovation has, has reached a very nice plateau. And we're going to see a lot of applications. Data and compute power are, the, are most important than ever. The models, the family of models will be standardized you will be able to download for free any kind of model, uh, but you must run it somewhere. And if you want a task-specific application, you need to have lots of data, or not so much anymore, due to zero shot. <clears throat> Each innovation becomes the enabler of a huge number of applications, so you can, uh, you can pick it up and use it. You don't even need to understand what's going under the hood. Only if you are a specialist and you need specific metrics to you need to hit some specific, specific metrics, and uh, the entry point is quite low. Hugging phase has made everything quite approachable. Now it's nice to know how we arrived here, all the innovations that preceded, but it's really not necessary to use any of the current models. Uh, hugging phase, huge fun. It uh, it makes everything so easy, especially for new buyers. And uh, the evolution continues. So if you keep, uh, if you stay in the in the course, you will see very nice stuff coming along, along with robotics, and uh, and that will be coming very soon. So 
Uh, I'm Nicolas Marcu. I'm from Electi. We help companies move to transition to the AI age. You can reach us here or on LinkedIn if you search for Electi or my name. Uh, I have a select number of papers for people that uh, that are interested in uh, in digging deeper. Uh, the surveys are quite nice uh, for those with uh, limited time. And the uh, two important papers, the attention, the two attention uh, papers. <clears throat> Thank you. And uh, I'll be taking questions now, if you, if anybody has any questions. Thank you so much, Nicola, for the amazing walkthrough. Uh, it's, it's indeed great to see how we get here and how it is, this is currently evolving as we no, talk day by day. Um, yeah, it's evolving at break, neck breaking speed. Uh, I, I encourage everyone to get involved in some way, in, either by using it or any tools or anything like that. Someone wants to talk or is it? Yeah, if someone has a question, please, please go on that. It's probably my microphone is somewhere. But uh, yeah, anyone with a question, please open your mic and drink it. Now it's the time. Anyone? No? All right. All right. If not, then if we we'll probably have the chance to catch Nicolas at some at some other point, especially if you're in Limassol. Um yeah. so thank you again, Nicola. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you again and thank you everybody for participating. We will see you again uh in one or two months from now with uh with a talk on now on, on strictly language models or large language models. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye bye. Cheers. Bye bye.